Thank you. We have a pretty uh, extensive agenda, so let's get right to it. We're going to start with uh, a presentation from Ms. Powell. All right. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi, Dave. I'm uh, Jennifer Powell. I'm one of the art teachers in the school. Um, this year, we had the pleasure of having a 3D printer brought into our school. We have one in the art room. And we also have one down in the technology room with Ms. Stringer. And for my classes, we are incorporating the 3D technology into our classes. I have two students who are here with me this evening, Jonathan Santoro and Cameron Conklin. They are both taking independent study with me to learn about the software that's involved in 3D printing and then also designing and um, creating Okay, so with the 3D printing, we uh, use this lovely website called Tinkercad, and uh, it was shown in a, a board uh, event meeting in September. Basically, what we do is we take shapes, we mold them together, and make these awesome objects in the computer and then to the 3D printer. And uh, what's also amazing about this website is there are community-made items that help make like the unimaginable. And uh, instead of just having shapes, you can create uh, like cityscapes or um, this uh, soccer ball. And uh, this is a very special item because we want to present this to the Mackenzie principal, Ms. Keegan, for that uh, wonderful Section 9 game. All those kids out there, that was fantastic. We, we, that was just an amazing crowd, and I uh, want to present this to you. <laughs> and uh, what, um, uh, I'm, all, I, all I could say is it was it's, it's a very fun and amazing uh, program that we used, and uh, I can't wait to see what's next. We can continue with that, and it's a lot of fun. Yep. Um, so the 3D printer works from a PLC plastic. It comes on schools, and it costs probably about 25 cents per print. Um, so you can really design um, things on a larger scale like like this, right? And you're just doing them in different pieces and then um, these all actually snap together like little Lego pieces. Um, and then you can also, you know, just design in, in solid forms. This is pretty durable, even if you stand on it, it doesn't break. Um, it will melt down over time with water because it is biodegradable. Um, and for next year, we are going to incorporate two half-year programs so that this way the students will be able to take a full year 3D printing class from um, the design and aesthetic all the way through the marketing of different items for um, everyday use. When do we get the 3D printer that does chocolate? <laughs> when does that one come? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I'd like to take that class too. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, we can only um, print out of plastic, so it's kind of like the uh, strawberry baskets in uh, the, the markets, the really thin plastic. It melts like a hot glue gun and then it layers it um, over and over again. Each print you can take about uh, anywhere between 5 to I mean, maybe up to 24 hours for a print. So the, um, the uh, 3D printing that we've heard about and yes. read about. Is this this is a version of that or this is the same thing? This it is, is the same thing. Yep. So 3D printing, there's a bunch of different 3D printers that you can have. Um, ours works from a spool of PLC plastic. 
You can also have a 3D printer that works from um, dust particles, and then the object is made from the dust um, by applying water or a different compound to it. Um, ours is really safe. The only thing that gets hot is the little extruder that's in here. Um, and as soon as it is paused, which it's paused right now, it immediately cools back down again so that there's really no risk for um, you know, heat or injury or anything like that. But yeah, this is a smaller version. This is a, de a desktop version of the 3D printer. They have ones that are you know, as large as this room probably. <laughs> But yeah, the kids really enjoy it. The software is really easy to use. They're using it down in Mackenzie too, I believe. Um, and it's really just a matter of um, learning how to put together different shapes. The math classes are also printing out of it as well. So this way we're doing a, uh, a cross curriculum. Just a quick question. Whoever was responsible, if it's you, I imagine it's a bunch of people, but thank you. I mean, God bless this small school. Thank you. Um, the next presentation is by uh, Colleen Costanza. Colleen is a uh, school counselor who is with us through a grant from Sullivan County Boces. Unfortunately, we were just advised this week that Colleen will be leaving us in two weeks. Um, she's moving on to bigger and better things, uh, but in the short time that she's been with us, she's uh, uh, contributed significantly uh, to some of the work that we were doing down at McKenzie. And in particular, what I've asked Colleen uh, to, tonight to do is to come here to uh, speak on the Botkin Life Skills Program. Uh, back in um, October, we convened a, a substance abuse task force. Uh, Mr. Santoro, you were there. A few others were there. And um, one of the things that, that came out of that was a partnership with Catholic Charities, who has been in several times to conduct uh, trainings for our faculty and our staff. Um, and one of the recommendations was uh, that for an educational component, and uh, Catholic Charities had recommended the Bachman Life Skills Program, which is a research evidence-based uh, substance abuse, uh, good decision-making type program. So we started to approach this in two phases. Uh, we instituted this in grades uh, uh, three through six down at the elementary school um, after the first of the year, and we're going to be uh, bringing it up uh, to the junior senior high school and the high school in September of this coming year. So just to give us an overview, I've asked uh, Colleen to come and make a short presentation to the board. Uh, when Colleen does leave, her replacement will be continuing this way. Um, there are handouts, thank you Mr. Robinson for printing those. Um, it does kind of give, again, an overview of the program and also the scope and sequence. Um, like Mr. DeFore said, it is an evidence-based program, um, substance and violence prevention. There are eight lessons, and how we've been doing it is we've been going in every other week. So we started in January, we should be wrapping it up uh, April, May-ish. Um, if you look, all the lessons for three through six, the topics are the same, um, but they build upon them each year. So uh, the first lesson is self-esteem and decision-making, uh, smoking information, advertising, dealing with stress, communication, social skills, and assertiveness. And each um, lesson is about 45 minutes long. I received a, I get like a teacher's manual for each um, grade level, so it pretty much tells you exactly how to run the program, and then I just bring this live on to create a PowerPoint just to make it a little bit more engaging for the students, and instead of me standing up there speaking the whole time, they can kind of, it gives them an opportunity to get up to interact with the smart board and for them to, to be speaking. They also um, have opportunities throughout the lesson to do group work um, and to participate in um, activities through these workbooks that they all get. Um, and at the end, there's like a journal so they all get to reflect on the lesson that was taught. The lessons, um, there's three areas of objectives that are being met with the lessons. Um, personal self-management skills, general social skills, and drug resistance skills. Um, the students, I've, I've had you know, pretty good success going in and teaching this to the students. They seem pretty engaged in it. Um, you know, I've heard students say, oh, this is 
know, this is my favorite class, and I have a class today, a student came up to me after, and said, oh, thank you so much for teaching that, I really enjoyed it. Um, so, so far we had great success, and I did speak with um, somebody over at Catholic Charities who has begun implementing the program in more of like the junior-senior high, and she's, you know, also reported really great things, that the students are really engaged and enjoying the lessons. So is this something we'll do every year then? It's part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Which it, I can see why it is, you know, the evidence is there because as I mentioned, it does build upon each year and they're mm -hmm. hearing the same terminology. It's just a little bit more and to fit right. their age. So it's, I think you guys will see great success with it. In the adult session? <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the board for uh, for coming up with this, for researching this, for having this program. I read on this. We've had the D.A.R.E. program once or twice before here, and it's been one time, and they've done it, and the kids gone through it, and they had a good time. But this is something that follows our children. It's not something that happens just one time. They see it in three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they're constantly being reminded. There's no downtime for them. And this is an important thing, because like anything else, practice makes perfect. So the more and more they go at it, the more and more they hear it, the more and more they start understanding and understanding that their lives are on the line if they go down the wrong path. So thank you for uh, being uh, uh, positive with it. Thank you for looking into it. And I believe this is the step in the right direction. So uh, I really do appreciate you guys doing that and allowing this to happen. So thank you. And Ms. Costanza, it says here the um Curriculum has been proven to help increase self-esteem, develop healthy attitudes, and improve their knowledge. Can you talk about how that how that's measured? It's been tracked over time. How kind of so the um, the first lesson is on self-esteem, and they really they focus on goal setting. So learning to set goals and what you have to do to reach that goal. So that also helps to build their self-efficacy. You know, feeling that empowerment when they reach that goal, or not even if they reach it, but that work ethic that they put towards it. So when they have that confidence and that self-esteem, it helps them to confidently make positive choices and decisions and not feel like they have to follow that peer pressure down a negative path. So they all kind of, all the lessons to wrap into each other, like the first lesson is those self-esteem and then decision-making and then smoking. And they each, even the students can see, oh yeah, this. This smoking, that relates to the decision making because we're the ones that have to make the decision if we're going to smoke or not. That relates to the self-esteem because we have to believe in ourselves to be able to say no. So they all, they all go hand in hand. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you very much. Then we next. Our next presentation is a budget presentation for the schools. There is really nothing new to report on the budget um, presentation. It's still what was handed out last month has not been changed at all. So we're there. We're waiting for the revenue uh, report from the state. Um, we have been told by our elected officials that we're going to expect an on time budget, so we should have those numbers at next month's board. In the past, we used to have a non-instructional presentation, an instructional presentation, and a revenue presentation. Ruth presented the non-instructional and instructional together at the same time, and um, it probably should have been removed from the agenda tonight because if there was no other presentation to be made tonight. She will go in a report be doing some updates on health insurance and uh, the tax levy on it. Uh, but at our April meeting, we will have our uh, revenue presentation, and then we will re review the expense side in general categories for non-instruction and instruction, um, and presenting it to the board for review by night. I thought we were going to have a discussion tonight about health insurance costs and real property tax cap slash tax in my report. report when I get to that. Okay, sure. Any other questions? Okay, let's move to um, our elementary principal report. Ms. Katie? Sure. Tomorrow is our half-day superintendent's conference day. Brian Boisel will be presenting contesting guidelines. PTA hosted book bingo on February 19th. 
we did have, um, well, actually, when I, we wrote this agenda, we thought we were going to have mad science up, up and away, EPA assembly, but um, there was a problem with them getting our school. So they, are, they will be rescheduled. Rescheduled, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I understand the circus was a huge hit at the high, it was presented at the high school, but it was a PBIS event and it was celebrated by many, many people. They enjoyed that. On Friday, March 4th, and Saturday, March 5th, was the All-County Music Festival held at Liberty High School. I have tons of kids that um, participated in this event, and I'd like to take a moment to read their names so they can be acknowledged. Congratulations to the following GRM students for being selected to participate in the All-County Middle School Band. Owen Anderson, Kylie Kuhn, Donald Mearden, Kate Nealon, Zoe Mizico, Justin known as Chip Petrie, and Caitlin Potter. Congratulations to the following GRM students for being selected to participate in the All County Women's Chorus that was Andy Davis. Congratulations to the following GRM students for being selected to participate in the All County Mixed Chorus, McKenna Cooper, Jalen Labuda, Adriana Cuomo, Andrew Pizzo, and Brady Ross. Also, congratulations to the following students for, be, for being selected to participate in the All County Elementary Chorus, Sophia Dearman, Natalie Edwards, Jacqueline Fry, Kaylin Cologne, Tori Kaiser, Raylan Keegan, Angelina Curley, Molly Koenig, Sebastian Mohan, Emma Rumsey, Caden Schrader, Schrader, Emma Siegel, Pearl Smith, Cassandra Weber, and Lindsay Zrodick. So we had a lot of children participate, and my hats go off to them. Okay. Epic Focus Group, it will be I'm sorry, Tuesday, March 15th, for Family and Friendly Walkthrough, um, and Wednesday, March 16th. So we still are looking for names of people who may like to participate in that. Please check our website and contact either the McKenzie office, um, Mrs. Anderson, or myself, and let us know if you'd like to participate. We're looking for people to be part of the group. Music in our Schools Month, Wednesday, March 16th at 6.30 p.m. at the Junior Senior High School. Five-week reports are going out this week. And of course, we have to end in March with Dr. Soup's Meets March Madness Craziness all held at GRM. And that was a fantastic week. Please check the website and our display board in our entranceway at McKenzie. It was a lot of fun. And um, a lot of I would like to congratulate Jen Heisler on that. She's a huge Dr. Seuss person, and she really put together the week for everyone's enjoyment. Any questions for me? Thank I you. just want to say, Thomas Keegan, that um, one, the circus was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I know you got a fun time too, Mr. Kreft. <laughs> it, was, it was really, um, I mean, even for adults, it was really, yes. really well done. It was quite awesome. And the all-county concert, um, those kids were amazing. And I, I was looking through the uh, the program as I was sitting there, and they got these big schools that all the kids listed, and then you have little old elders, and there was a bunch of kids listed. It was impressive how many kids mm -hmm. were there, and they were really um, incredible. And I, I was almost kind of overwhelmed because I had come from the basketball game in Newburgh and then drove up to Liberty to see this concert. And I thought on both ends with sports and with music, it was just really fantastic uh, what's going on in Elk right now on both ends. So. And what an opportunity that is for, for kids to meet other kids in the county. I mean, oh, they've sure. gone and, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes they need to go to the bench if it lasts for a while or forever, you know? They do. They were there Friday night pretty late, and they were there all day Saturday. And yep. They had a yeah. class. Well, they'll see each other next year. And yeah. Say, you know, it's very bonding, yes. And it sounds, you can't believe it, but I was in the yeah. They really did sound fantastic. And the spring orchestra was, sounded like, like a symphony. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, I have a question about Brian Orzel. Mm -hmm. Who is Brian Orzel? <coughs> I'll speak to that. Brian Orzel is from uh, the regional C task, the special ed group out of. Uh, Dutchess County, and he's coming service. in to do a presentation on testing accommodations for the state and general uh, classroom assessments. There, there are all kinds of um, special requirements if a child has an IEP that need to be recognized by everybody, every teacher in the school, even if they um, aren't special ed teachers. Um, 
Brian, uh, Brian and I worked very closely together for the years that I was at, in Poughkeepsie. We, we both served the Orange County, Dutchess County, Southern County, and Ulster County. And we get trained by the state, and so the, the, he, he would have gone up in October and again in January um, and gotten the latest. So he brings that back it's from for, the state. It's, it's for state assessments and classroom assessments before you on board. We, um, uh, had an issue where a parent had filed a complaint about testing irregularity during last year's administration for state assessments. Uh, that uh, uh, resulted in an investigation by the uh, district superintendent who found no wrongdoing on the part of the district, yet the state required us to uh, present a corrective action plan, and this was a requirement of the corrective action plan. And this is specifically for kids with IEPs and special education? Special needs kids, yes. Thank you. Anything else? And uh, let's hear from Mr. Krebs with the secondary principal report. Good evening. So I'm going to start with our sports report um, since Mr. Guest is not here with us. Um, at this time, our winter season will be completed after this weekend. It will be the conclusion of our winter season. The girls' basketball team is playing in Troy at uh, Hudson Valley Community College for the final four. And their first game is Saturday morning at 1045. It will be a great experience for them. The boys basketball team also had a fantastic year getting to the regional finals where they um, came up a little short against a pretty good team in Bridgehampton. Our indoor track team competed this state qualifier and had a very good showing at the meet to end their season. Wrestlers, uh, we sent two, Noah Carrera and Luke Jones to the state tournament this year with Noah placing fifth in the state in his weight class. Overall, it has been an amazing winter season with the successful teams and successful events here at Elbrid, and we are look, looking forward to our spring uh, season as practices have begun this past Monday. So um, spring sports are already upon us. I'd like to congratulate all of our participants, students in pretty much 9th and 10th grade that participated in the Global Fair. That was this past March 2nd. It was a nice turnout. Um, by a number of people and awards were given to the top uh, students in each of the categories. We also had um, Mr. Nivison sent me a little brief report about the um, All County Music Concert that was held. Naturally each year they kind of select different groups so one year you might have a senior high band and next year you might have a, a junior high band or a middle school band so but overall we had approximately 35 percent of our music uh, students participating in the all-county concert this past weekend so that's quite a large number um, even though some of the groups were not represented we had students across all grade levels that had uh, participation I was able to see the early concert at um, 2 30 and then there was a later one uh, that evening and Mr. Siegel had mentioned about how great it was to listen to a middle school band um, that performed some uh, a level three and a level uh, four piece um, for us at the event. So that was wonderful. This upcoming week, I'm going to be attending the middle level spring co conference in Albany. It's for middle level educators. Um, on the agenda items will include uh, Commissioner Ela will update us on all of the things at the um, at the state level. There'll be a presentation on schools to watch, which are um, schools to watch is a good thing for middle level educators. It's a group of schools that typically have risen above a level, maybe the silver level or gold level schools recognized either in the state or in the country. And they usually do presentations on what sets them apart from everybody else at the middle level. So as you know, that middle level, that it's usually typically fifth through eighth grade is where they determine the middle level of kids. We'll also have a presentation on AIS services and RPI best practices. And there will be also information on the free grade assessments, changes, and things like that. So that's where I get a lot of my information that happens and I bring it back to people here in the county. So pretty good uh, conference. There's a number of other things that are addressed on. Usually they have stuff on math, science, social studies, English, and each of those group levels also. Um, what else do we have? We have Griffin here for the student council. He had a couple of things to mention. I know there was a, um, a meeting that was supposed to be today, but it's next week. Yep, it's, okay. it's next week. So I thought uh, we short. Last meeting I discussed how student council had nominees for their uh, student council 
excellence awards, which are we recognize students for different areas such as music and athletics and academics, you know, student government, all sorts of stuff. So out of the, I believe, 21 or 22 nominations, we selected five winners. Uh, we had like a special committee set up that selected these students. So uh, I'm just going to list off the names to acknowledge them. So excellence in student involvement, we have Chris Weber. Excellence in student involvement, we have Lindsay Kelpie. Excellence in student government is myself. Excellence in community service is Samantha LaFoot. And excellence in future readiness is Alyssa McGrail. So congratulations to all those nominees, and we'll be giving out certificates, and we'll hopefully get a picture on the website, and it'll be good. So. Uh, that's it? Yeah. What? Yeah, that's it. Sure. Sure. I know. That's <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And that's it? Yeah, does anybody have any questions for me? Okay. Yes, that is it. Very good. Thank you. And for our business office report from the schools. Okay, so I submitted the real property tax 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 free summary um, that allow, projected the allowable levy growth factor at 1.0012. And after exclusions, the increase to the 2015-16 levy is approximately $65,000. So in other words, our tax levy can be increased by approximately $65,000 at the maximum for 16-17. I also uh, attended an OU Health meeting, and the insurance rate, insurance rate increase is scheduled to be at 4.75, which will create an additional cost to the district of about $89,500 for 16-17. That's for TRS. That is for OU Health, the health insurance. Oh, the health insurance, mm -hmm. not the, not the yeah. retirement. No, TRS and ERS were in, already included in the packet I handed out last month. That's already been taken care of. As I said, the revenues have not yet been projected because we're waiting for Albany, but we are anticipating an on-time budget. I'm happy to announce that Kim Phillips will be starting in the business office on March 14th as a part-time shared account clerk for Sullivan West, and it's going to help me to be able to focus on other things that are more financially really need my focus and uh, Kim will pick up some of the clerical that will relieve me to be able to do other things. The point of sale system in the cafeteria has been pushed off until April. It was scheduled for March, but we did push it off because we had some changes <coughs> and we just felt that we needed more time to make sure it was a smooth transition and a smooth operation. So letters have gone out to parents electronically. We posted on the website, and the students' PIN numbers are will be forthcoming over the spring break. They'll be sent out so that they will have them and be able to hopefully memorize them prior to the system going live. And that's in the high school. Mackenzie has been pushed off until May. And speaking of Mackenzie, the Food Service Department is going to undergo an administrative review by SED on March 15th, which is Tuesday. And that is a triennial review done every three years, and they go through all of the expenses and revenues and the books and the free and reduced, and we're gathering all that information for them so that they'll have it available. And CEO has been most cooperative in assisting getting them. Information. Were we prepared for the, um, or did we expect that health insurance increase to that degree? Actually, it was projected to be more like 7 or 8 percent. And the, uh, the executive, the trustees of the health insurance, we, had, we met and made some uh, adjustments to the plan that put some cost savings and made some fund balance and make up the gap. So that so still has to be worked into the budget, but that's not getting budget that much. Budget that budget that much. Oh, that we so we will have to mm -hmm. modify that. That's one of the modifications we'll be bringing back here. Yeah, right. Now that we have these guys. Yeah, yeah, the last yeah. number we're waiting for is the POSIS administrator. Okay, and that's the last one we need before we can make final tweaks. Okay.
I thought I saw, I might be mistaken, but in the last month's budget presentation you put forth, there was a $200,000 increase in health premiums from last year to this year. So what you're saying is that that 200000 now is 89.5. Okay. I over based on what they were projecting. Well, that's good news. That's good news. But what, what causes a 4.75% increase in health insurance from year to year? An increase in the claims that were experienced over the year. There were some catastrophic claims that were upwards of a million dollars, some organ transplants, some we have an in vitro fertilization benefit and that oftentimes will result in multiple births, multiple premature births. And the cost of those, the care for those children is excessive, mm -hmm. and that will push the health insurance fund into a deficit, mm -hmm. and that's what happened. So we're in a pool, you said OU Health, OU Health is a pool. It's a consortium of 21 school districts, 21 school districts, we're the only Sullivan County district in that plan. There's also one in Ulster, and the rest are all Orange County school districts. It's the Orange Ulster Health Plan, but then... The benefits exceed the ones that our uh, neighboring districts have, and the premiums have always historically been lower. Yes, it's a co comparable so it's plan. A much better value than we can walk for. And to be hit, very comparable, and the, the lowest premium. And there are no private sector plans that uh, are not school-based plans that would be more competitive and still good for the staff. That, you know, it, to change your health insurance plan requires conversations with your bargaining units because oftentimes it's dictated in their contracts mm -hmm. that it will be that plan or one comparable. Okay, just I believe that it wasn't that long ago yeah. that we did a complete exactly. review of all available to that was done under Dr. Burnell when there was yeah. a contract negotiation going on and right. it was either we were saying less or wash. Yeah. At that time. So, so we did, I mean, we did the complete review like, however like, long ago that was, maybe five, four or five years ago. Oh, it was done, done under Dr. Burnell, so it's more like seven or eight years ago. Was it that long ago? Yeah. Time flies, but you're having fun. No, we can't. Okay, then. Okay. It's not been done since I've been super yet. No, I know. Do you think, though, do you think, though, that there is a better product that would be better for our faculty and staff that might, you know, be uh, comparable or even less expensive than this plan, or is this like the gold standard plan? This is the gold standard plan. I don't know that you're going to get another plan comparable to this for the price, because I will tell you, I I had night shift in a previous life, and the premiums were much higher with night shift. And when I came here, it was seamless. I experienced no disruption in benefits, and this is a less expensive. You can anticipate the next review in 2018 if the Cadillac tax does go into effect under Obamacare. If they start uh, forcing uh, districts that have uh, and businesses in districts that have the Cad uh, a Cadillac health plan under their terms and definitions. And we have to start looking at paying the tax. Every public entity is going to start shopping their uh, health benefits. Uh, we're actually hoping that uh, either whether it's a Democrat or Republican, that that will go away. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> regarding the point of sale system for the high school and the elementary school, there's a month delay because of some changes that you said. What were yes. the changes? Well, one of the things was that we um, extended the spring break and it was supposed to start that week. And to start it and then have the children go on spring break, they're going to forget their kids. Yep. So there's no, no point to that. And the training for the people in the cafeteria as well. Okay. I thought it might be something with the system. No. No, it's all ready to go. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Anything else? In our district report from Mr. Before. I just have a couple of items. Um, first, uh, you'll see a couple of mentions on the agenda uh, referring to this. Um, to combat the continuing rise in opiate-related deaths in New York State, laws were recently enacted allowing schools to provide and maintain opiate antagonists, uh, naloxone, or commonly called Narcan, on site to ensure ready and appropriate access for use during emergencies to any staff or student suspected of having opiate overdose whether or not there is a previous history of opiate abuse. 
Narcan will reverse the effects of opiates in the case of a suspected overdose. It is given by a nasal Sprite. Narcan only works on reversing opiates taken. It will not harm if given and opiates were not the cause of the suspected overdose. Uh, both school nurses have been trained and maintain Narcan kits in their medical offices, and all of our full-time and substitute security officers have also been trained and have their own personal kits as well. And the two items that are on the agenda tonight are to officially enact that to make it official. There may be an additional policy coming down from the School Nurses Association. They were hoping to have it on my desk by this morning. It was to see it never arrived. So, so that we can proceed and do what we need to do legally. The language that is in the resolution and on the board agenda comes from our attorneys. Uh, once the School Nurse Association gets me their model draft resolution, I will have it compared, and if we need to make any alterations, that will be a future reading. But it is on there to now. What we're doing is the bare minimum will allow us. Uh, we're going to do it no matter what. I'm sorry. But this will allow us to do it. So. Uh, this is pretty widespread among the schools that... that I uh, think we're one of the first schools officially. Okay, I know a lot of nurses have privately been trained. Okay. Okay, we started sending our people out because there was the whole thing about school nurses being trained in a particular fashion, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of people have been trained, but I don't know how many districts have actually gone through the resolution process yet. Um, but I think you will see everyone follow suit very quickly. So we've had some outspoken uh, proponents of this, and I think some, didn't some of our coaches go on their own time to get trained on this so, um, Some of our um, our nurses are coaches, okay? Mrs. Drew, yep. okay? Uh, and she's also, uh, you know, one of, she's a track coach, and she's also one of my LPNs. Huh? But um, part of the nurse training ultimately would be is they're going to be able to train others. Okay. So the ultimate intent would be to get the coaching staffs trained once the association tells our nurses they can train others. Gotcha. You said it was uh, through nasal? It's yes. a nasal effort? Okay. So it's not a shot? It's no, it's a nasal spray. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Again, I, I, I'm thankful that our district is on top of this. The Comprehensive <laughs> District <laughs> Education Plan is presently undergoing an interim review by the CDEP committee, targets and goals are being reviewed, updated, and revised where necessary. The current plan runs through June 2017. Uh, the district wellness plan is also undergoing a thorough review. Though recently reapproved to comply with audit regulations, it was agreed to review the policy more in depth and make necessary revisions to make it more current and relevant. Several subcommittees will be established under the coordination of Mr. Siegel and Ms. Keegan. It's anticipated that a fully revised policy will be uh, represented to the full board for review and discussion at either the May or the June meetings. And finally, um, as you all hopefully know, uh, the uh, Elder Performing Arts uh, production of Brees uh, is right around the corner. Um, we will be having a preview performance uh, either the Wednesday or Thursday, correct, uh, Bonnie, before is what we're trying to set up? We are. Yeah, we have been exactly established a date we're working with the seniors. To uh, have a uh, uh, preview performance for our senior citizens um, uh, in the gym. We'll be serving live refreshments to them. Mm -hmm. It will not be the full-blown performance because I... Sam, are you in it? Are you in the play? No, I'm not. Okay, I think it runs. Who's it? Anyone You're in the play? Really first? How, how long is it? It's about two and... Something like that. Two, it's about two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's the length yeah. of a normal... Well, the, the normal play itself <coughs> is like two and a half hours. Okay, so they're going to do like a, an abridged version of it. Um, so that will also give them more additional dress rehearsal. And, uh, what are the dates of the, of the plot? Uh, April 22nd and 24th. Okay, and that's all I have. Any questions for Rob? Do you have a date of, you said you're still working on a date for the... Yeah, Bonnie was just on the phone with them today. Her and Justin are working with them to coordinate the day. That's very nice. I'm glad you guys have It's been very successful. You know, it's a nice It's been very successful in the past. Okay, uh, I just have two things. Um, last Friday, myself, Bob, Linda, and Carol went to um, a meeting with John Bonasek, 
and Caitlin Gunther, as well as the rest of the um, the rest of the superintendents and, and some Board of Education members from other school districts. It was, it was essentially a roundtable discussion uh, where the superintendents were, were explaining, correct me if I get this wrong, please, were explaining um, you know, the, the sort of assistance that they thought the legislators could, the legislators could give them. Um, some of the things that came up were mandate relief and, you know, additional help with some shared services and, of course, you know, money, um, gap elimination restored, uh, money, um, you know, it, you know it's, it's one of those things. It, and what struck me was the Fallsburg, the Fallsburg Board of Education president is explaining to Mr. Bonasek that that their budget in the last oh my gosh I want to say was it three years uh, no. or it was either it was three to five years but it was extraordinary in the in the last let, let's go let me be crazy and say six years their budget went from twenty and a half million to forty two million dollars but let's let's just let's just make sure we all understand that. <laughs> because we're sitting here without it's that. doubled. And you know, in six years, our budget is the same. Doug, so, did that include um, tax cap overrides, or was that? Yeah, how did they get that pass? Well, it depends on what they had before they started. That's what he said, right? The tax cap. That's what, what he said. We heard him say that. So, so we would go to the if, if, if they were staying within the tax cap for the past three years, that means the bulk of that increase was the previous. And don't forget that most schools had a substantial reserve prior to the tax. This has nothing to do with reserves. This is their that would be their budget. Right? I know, but that would be they would have could have and would have used their reserve to increase that. So this budget. was an actual dollar for dollar increase in their budget. So that's how much their taxes went up like that also then? It, it, it would conceivably had to win. Unless you misstated himself, like that's what he said. That, that's what the gentleman said. So, so, so I, I just I, I share that with you folks, not not to say that not not to say that they're doing something wrong, but we're doing something wrong. I just need you to understand where where our neighboring school districts are. Okay. Um, What's Paul for the wrong? They're about twelve hundred. No, 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 they're not big. I mean, they're, they're in the lower, uh, they're in the middle here. Liberty uh, is larger. Um, Monticello is larger. I actually think Tri Valley is the same, and uh, Sullivan West is about the same. But you have a couple right there in the middle. You have Eldred, Livingston Manor, and Roscoe down here, and Monticello up on the top. And and the other thing that I wanted to share with you is, you know, um, I, I wasn't able to attend the boys basketball game um, out in Long Island. I couldn't get off work, but. Um, the girls' game last week, you know, at, um, the girls' game last Saturday, it, what a tremendous experience. It was, you know, um, the, the, the crowd, you know, it was like, it was like everybody, everybody was just, I mean, everybody left Eldred and went to Newburgh for the afternoon. It was, it was, it was amazing. It really was. And uh, obviously the kids did very well. Um, and. You know, just a great experience, great um, community support, um, and, and, and again, you know, all the all the kudos goes to our kids, and that's why we're here. So, and same congratulations for our boys. And again, I apologize for not making it out to one night. But, uh, but um, that's all I have. Any uh, questions? Good. So, um, anything else? Yes. Okay, so then we have public comment that's limited to our consent agenda, and I meant to say this um, just because just be, I, I was encouraged um, a couple of weeks ago to to sort of give a brief description of how our meeting runs. Essentially, essentially, the agenda is broken up to um, reports, um, a brief public comment, a consent agenda. Consent agenda is is, is all the business of the board. Um, and, and we vote on that basically with one motion and subsequent vote. 
So if the, the first public comment is meant just to, ju just in case someone had, had uh, an opinion one way or the other with regards to our consent agenda. So, um, so that's where we're at right now. Later we'll have uh, new business, then old business, and then a public comment for anybody to, that wishes to address the board. Okay, so this is our first public comment just for consent agenda items. Does anybody have public comment? Okay, then we'll need a motion to accept the consent agenda, okay. uh, 401 to 705. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Takes us to 8.01. Uh, parents' right to refuse state testing. Now, now, given given the lengthy meeting, the, the lengthy meeting that we had in December, and subsequently we developed a a uh, let, me, let me say this correctly. We subsequently developed a resolution um, with regards to our beliefs, uh, we felt it, it appropriate to um, ask Mr. DeFore to draft some sort of a, some sort of a letter giving, you know, uh, parents information, let me say this correctly, parents information about their rights as it relates, do you want to talk to this? No, I didn't ask to have this put on the agenda. What, you, this item here? Yeah. yeah. That was Mr. LaPorte that asked to well, have that put no. on the agenda. That's Oh, so you so have, then, have to take action on this. So then, what we did was we we essentially um, we essentially decided that it would be a good thing to ask Mr. Dufour to draft some kind of letter to um, outline our parents' rights and responsibilities as, as it's related to testing. Am I saying all this right? I think so, Doug. Um, I have. Uh, I had a chance, you guys gave me the opportunity to go to the NISBA convention sure. in New York City this summer and uh, this fall. It seemed like forever. Mm -hmm. And I met some folks who uh, are board members on districts that have been kind of in a different situation than we are in terms of opt-out. Um, I met the folks from Patchogue Medford who's been very outspoken in opt-out uh, as a board. Uh, even their superintendent has been very outspoken. Um, I've spoken with their superintendent and their, some of their board members. And I also recently spoke with some of the folks from um, Fairport, which is up by Rochester, mm -hmm. um, just because I had met them personally and I had their contact information. And I asked them, where did their letters come from in terms of the letters that they sent home to the parents to suggest that parents do have the right to opt out of standardized tests. And they even have provided forms that the parents can check off. I would like to opt out of math. I'd like to, like to opt out of English. I would like to not opt out. And they could send it to the school. And what they suggested is that, first of all, they started this discussion about three years ago on Common Core and standardized testing. We've just begun this conversation six months ago, so they're kind of ahead of us. And they also uh, said that their letters and all of their resolutions that they passed as a board came from the grassroots. In other words, their community kind of came at them uh, in, an, in an organic way and suggested that this is what they need to do. I think we're in a little bit of a different situation because it, this conversation was initiated by the board, and we passed a resolution which is very strong and I think it's wonderful. But we have not talked about opt-out purposely, I think, because I suggested it to you guys as a board before I joined you as a board, and I got the sense that it was not the right time to be talking about the board's position on opting out. And then we've gone through a whole progression of conversations about this, and I think we now need to get to the point where we can provide guidance to our parents about their rights and provide them a vehicle if they want to opt out without putting Mr. DeFord in the middle of it, right? Also, one thing I wanted to say is the Boards of Education made it very clear that this was a board thing and not a superintendent thing. In other words, the board directed the superintendent to send this letter, and they specified kind of the criteria of what should be in the letter. And in some cases, superintendents are made to feel very comfortable by this because they're agents of the state, and there's certain things that they cannot say, but there's certain things that we can say. So I hope that helps. 
and this letter that's sitting in front of us, is this the recommendation that we will, I looked at if some we of approve it? I looked at some of the stuff that was there. I found it to be way too wordy. Yes. And I kind of went through and picked and choose what I thought would express your desires. And on the front is the letter, on the back is the form. It will actually go out as two separate pieces of paper. No, it will. Yeah, because unless I print, please turn over. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want somebody going through the envelope looking for something that, that they can't find. But um, I think this conveys what you want to do in as succinct a manner as possible. You don't have one, Brian? No, I, I think I find this place. I'm looking at this key. Okay. Um, I like the way this is phrased. I like the, I think we walk a fine line as a Board of Education and as the representatives of the public school. Um, I don't think we want to be for or against opting out. I believe we want to stay firmly where this letter seems to keep us, which is yes, parents have that right, and yes, we will do nothing to stand in their way. We will do nothing to, um, to stop them from opting their children out, and there will be no penalty, which is basically what this says. I do like that it says parents should not act out of portions of tests because then the state, if they, have, if, they get to, if they get to score part of the test, then they score the whole test and it's a failing grade. If they inadvertently answer one question. Right, so if they start the test and then opt out, then that's no good at all. Well, the way we've always done it in the past, right up to the time they walk into the test, a parent could scribble a note on a napkin and have their child refuse the test, but children cannot refuse the test. No, no They're children, They're not right? to do it, it has to be by the parent. So we haven't, pers we haven't had that as an issue where somebody started the test and then stopped it. But what that does refer to is, and we've actually made calls home last year, we've had parents who send in a note on day two oh. and say, we don't want our kid to take the test, and Mr. Krebs and Ms. Mm. Keegan has called home and says, please understand, We'll gladly honor your request, but your child's paper will, in fact, be scored because they've started one part of the test. Mm -hmm. um, there's a million different varieties of letters and forms here. Um, the one that we pulled this statement about not opting out of portions of tests comes from Fairport, and they only did this last year. They hadn't done it the previous year. They, they were a little bit more cautious. Actually, I think most of it comes from Fairport. Does it? Okay. I was the other one. I was, it was just too wordy for me. I, I think I took the best points out of both of them, but most yeah. of it's Fairport. Well, I, if, interestingly, if you look at Fairport's letter last year, Fairport's letter last year was very definitive uh, and basically made statements like, definitively, will there be a penalty for the school district or for parents for opting out? They just said no. Okay, now they come a little bit soft because they got a new superintendent who wasn't as comfortable as their previous superintendent, but the board's position hasn't changed. But this statement is a soft statement and it's meant to, um, to be more cautious, but it could cause confusion. So it says, please know that parents and guardians should not opt out of portions of tests as the state requires the partial score be recorded and coded as a failing score. Total test refusals are coded as such and not scored. I think that a lot of people are gonna misunderstand what that means because we're using words like failure, and should not, and I think that if there's not any danger of this happening, or there's limited danger of it happening, we should kill that sentence because it might discourage people from opting out thinking that they're penalizing their child or their teacher or their school. Well, does that mean if they opt out of a portion that it will, the partial score will be reported? And that is, a, that is a true statement, but I agree. I don't want to scare anybody into thinking, oh, we can't opt out because then they're going to have a failing score. So we could perhaps be a little wordier in that paragraph. <laughs> no, I, I agree with that, that. They can opt out, but they have to opt out of the whole test. Right. That's what the whole top. ELA or the but whole math. The the but but is it, is it, would somebody but intend to opt out of a portion of the test? I well, think they would opt out. It did happen last year. Uh, I told you it. Yeah. 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 it did well, happen last year. Three 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 so maybe we should spell it that if you're opting out, you're opting out of a whole test. But I wouldn't use words like failure or code as a failing score because even I struggled as a parent last year with whether we should opt out because I didn't want to hurt the district. Mm -hmm. Then what I would say is leave, please know that parents and guardians should not opt out slash refuse portions of test as the state requires that a partial score be recorded, period. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Take the second half out. Mm -hmm. Is it, I would suggest killing the whole paragraph. This, this I think can be confusing to a lot of people. Uh, but if we have to let them know though that they shouldn't want to opt out on the third day. Oh, my kid doesn't feel good today, I'll opt you out of day three. 
because then that's a failing score. You see what I'm saying? That's what I'm afraid might happen. But so do we have, maybe we need to provide a QA and a like other schools have done to say, you know, um, is the school penalized with less than 95% participation or by opting out? The answer is no. Um, that's the answer not, is we don't know. We don't know. That's that's not, you're making a definitive statement. I can't comfortably can't endorse that definitive that. statement because we don't know. I, I, say we, I say we just strike the paragraph and leave it at that. It has not happened yet. The state has not done it as of yet, even the schools with far larger opting out uh, numbers yes, than we have. that's correct. They have not done it yet, but they There's still no reserve the right to do it. They do. I don't think they will, actually. But, uh, I need to really make this clear. Yeah. 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 The reaction I got was, you know, don't don't feel you can, you have to do the whole thing. You know, you make sure you do the portion. But how about if you took the last sentence, total test refusals, bold that are coded and such as such are bold, not scored. I think it'd be better just to strike the paragraph. Yeah, but I think they need to know. I don't know that there's a good way to say so they need to, to say that. That if they start we'll, a test, we'll to continue on the current track that if somebody decides to try it afterwards, the principals will call them to yeah. explain. Because it's yeah. not going to be that many people, right? Because right now there's no. Oh, we'll have a significant no more opting out this year, trust me. Right. That's what we don't want. Oh, yes. Yeah. Once no, we send no, this no, letter out, there's, there's a number of opt outs. Oh, yeah. There's no. See, so that's going to be too. Just leave it oh, out. Oh, I will opt out. But, well, why does it scary, though? No, I mean. No, I didn't mean that scare me. But it scares me if they don't know that if they start the test and don't finish it, then that's going to be it. Truthfully, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, fine. It, it doesn't matter one way or the other because it doesn't count. It doesn't count. In other words, we're not using the scores. Right. The scores aren't being used for anything. That's true. Okay. I mean, this is an exercise in ridiculousness. So it doesn't matter. All right. Keep going. The only benefit, I think, to doing a letter like this, well, first of all, there's two benefits. One, some parents don't know that they have to write. I mean, there's been so much propaganda through state ed department and through the media to suggest that if you opt out, your school's going to be penalized in some way. If your participation falls below 95%, Title I funds are going to be taken away. There's been so much propaganda that a lot of parents are confused. I was one of them. You know, we were concerned about that. So I think it's incumbent upon the Board of Education to inform parents about the fact that they do have the right. In fact, the New York State Governor Cuomo has said so. Commissioner Elliott has said so. I think we owe it. The other thing is that if test scores really are being overvalued by our district, and I would hope that they're not because we spelled it out very clearly in a resolution, but if there's any hesitancy or, or any tendency to overvalue test scores to where we feel like we really have to prepare kids to pass even developmentally inappropriate standardized tests, that a significant increase in the percentage of opt-out would dissuade you from that kind of moral dilemma. In other words, if fewer kids take the test, maybe we feel less obligated to prepare them to, be, to do well on the test, because we know that preparing them to do well on the test, particularly in lower grades, is counterproductive to their educational health. So I think that's the second benefit. If you take a look at the letter, I think item two, is a definitive enough statement that we can remove that last paragraph. It's basically saying mm -hmm. this must be delivered up yeah. to and including no the, the first the test. Right. And the form on the back has it in bold and in two places. Yeah. So we can take out that paragraph. Right. Yeah, so I just need a motion from the board and then this will go out tomorrow. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Okay, so let's be clear. The, the, the motion is for Mr. DuFour to distribute the letter as written, uh, less the paragraph we just noted to strike. Correct. Okay. Everybody in agreement with that? With the form on the reverse side. Yeah, yes. with the form on the reverse side. Is everyone in agreement with that? Well, the form will be a second page. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry, the paragraph after number three, yes. that yes. entire paragraph yes. is gone. To, okay. to strike the paragraph after three, the one that we've been discussing. It was designed to be explanatory, but it's not It's not helping, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Can I ask about the other side of the form for review of the form? I saw this, the first sentence, the State Education Department believes New York State grades three through eight assessments have educational value. <clears throat> I saw that in the Fairport letter, but I only saw it in this year's version of the Fairport letter. Remember what I said? The reason why their letter changed from the last year to this year was that they 
trying to go easy on their superintendent. In other words, they don't believe as a board that the three through eight assessments have any educational value. But they included that statement to soften it up. Um, I think we've been very clear how we feel about the three through eight assessments. And I don't know that we have to sell to our parents on behalf of the state education department that we fully believe in the value of the three through eight assessments in their current form. I don't think we're saying that. I, I think we're just saying that um, we're not saying yes or no, and you have the right to talk about I think, I, which I, I, I feel much better being there than saying, I think those tests have no value. Oh, no, I don't want to say that either. I just okay. don't want, I don't want right. to be a mouthpiece for them, because right. the fact is right. that, you know, we know it. I would strike the first sentence. Well, I think yeah. that please, the standard yeah. is requiring each district to provide three through eight tests for me. I'm okay with saying that. I'm okay to say we require two tests. That's good. Can you say what you mean? What do you mean? The New York Education Department requires our district to offer two tests. Just put the Eldred Central School District Board of Education who meets in the right of parents slash guardians to make educational decisions regarding their child's education. Okay. That's fine. Give the first sentence. Okay. And we don't administer field tests, do we? We have, we do. Yeah, we do. We do. Not this year because I refuse to administer them this year. However, we do do them in um, for regions exams. Uh, the regions exams. We really don't have much of a choice in that. And I know it's stated here. Was, they wanted us to do the computer based uh, assessment this year, and I refuse to do it this year. However, that is a decision that the board may be faced with. In future years, because in the past it required us to uh, administer uh, written field tests, and they really didn't give us much of an option. Um, I decided to try to reduce it this year, and uh, I got away with it. Uh, Rick uh, Gene Knudsen called me and told me what I needed to do. I went in and created the computer program, and nobody ever questioned it, so we're fine with that. But uh, there could be a point where the board may have to take an official policy stand on that, we just don't have to do it. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. Let me just let me just again we're gonna strike the paragraph after item three on the front. We're gonna strike the first sentence on the back. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No, thank you. We're only going to three through eight. Right, right. Gentlemen, both. Yes. Carol? Yes. Linda? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Carol? Yes. And I'll say yes. Thank you. Okay. We neglected, um, I, I had. This is totally my fault, guys. I apologize. A 706 um, agenda item that wasn't on our agenda. I had a loose. Um, do you want to read this for me, please? This would be item 7.06. Approval upon the recommendation of the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the 2015-2016 Health and Welfare Services contract with the Valley Central School District for two students in the amount of. Do we have an amount? The amount of the total sum. I apologize. But that's just one student. You said two students. There is only one. Yeah, there's only there's one, one now. Oh, one student. One thousand three hundred seventy-nine. Thank you. Always one student. What is this? Yeah, we did. I apologize. Never mind. Oh, we're talking. Okay. Okay. So, do we have any other new business, guys? Okay. Moving on to old business, we have um, the announcement of the Board of Education seat vacancy. It's our term of on board of the five-year term from July 1, 2016, through July 30, 2021. Petitions are available from the district clerk and must be filed with the office by April 18, 2016. Uh, 902, final call for Hall of Fame nominations. They must be submitted to the district clerk. And there's a date on that, too, right? Excuse me? There's a date on that, isn't it? Um, it just says on the agenda, final call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. 
I don't know. You want to make one up? I'll make one up. Thank you. Um, 903, reminder of the district budget vote, May 17, 2016, from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the junior senior high school. And one thing on that item, um, Mr. Keene is employed by the district now in a full-time capacity, and uh, that means he cannot serve as chair of the vote. However, we did, Bonnie did some research, and we are not required to have a chair of the vote. It was a long, long practice from many years ago that was carried forward for many years, but um, our vote judges and the people that we have worked in the polls uh, suffice. Excellent. We don't need a chair. Excellent. And they will read that whole thing ahead. Okay. Yeah. Is there any benefit to doing it? Having a chairman of the vote? It actually, um, I'm going to, Bonnie will forward you all the email from Wendy. It actually goes back to a time where somebody would need be needed to certify the credentials of an individual to vote in small towns where uh, they may not have had. Yeah, it, there's a little history of you know, so, yeah. it. So send it out to the floor. Really? Yeah. 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 Just a little, little little piece, and it's something of a bygone era. Okay. That was just carried by yeah. Yeah. So, so essentially, it's it's a town person that would say, "Yep, yeah, that's when the she can vote." No, no kidding. Basically, that's <laughs> that's that's the way I read it. The way to do everybody. Very interesting. Yeah, I would just say that. Yeah. So um, the next thing is our board event workshop. Um, we had we had uh, offered a um, we had discussed having a board event workshop. Um, where we would discuss roles and responsibilities, and um, uh, oh my gosh, I, open meeting, open meeting laws, and so on and so forth. So, um, so what happened was, and and I need to explain this to everyone. We we reached out to um, the board's attorney or the, the school district's attorney, and she had recommend recommended that we um, get a facilitator to come to us and, and, and do this meeting for us or do this workshop for us. And uh, Bob and I looked at the credentials and, and uh, winced at the fee. And um, so we decided that that probably wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be where we would want to go. And then we looked at, uh, we talked about perhaps having um, a, a NISBA organized workshop and um, you know so so that's where we're at right now I happen to think that the NISBA organized workshop you know we had one earlier in the in the summertime and it was beneficial mm -hmm. I just felt like I just felt like I didn't want to do over of that you know what I mean so um, I'm tossing it out to you guys um, I think that if, if you know, if we all convene together and and discuss, you know, our, um, you know, the way we, uh, you know, our visions and our goals and our, um, you know, the, our perception of these laws, I think we can, I think we can get to the bottom of, or, you know, where we where we are now and where we where we need to go. Thoughts? I have a couple of suggestions, but we talked about this a little bit. Um, I would like to actually modify my proposal and the purpose for the board workshop because I, what I had suggested was that we talk about roles and responsibilities for uh, both individual board members and the board as a collective and open meetings law. Open meetings law I think is actually pretty easy because NISBA um, has an e-learning uh, product uh, that we subscribe to. We could actually just watch that together, you know, in a workshop. Mm -hmm. I think it's like probably less than an hour, and then we could have a discussion. I think that's pretty straightforward, and, and that might be the good vehicle for that. The roles and responsibilities. I gave this a lot of thought. I just handed you, by the way, a presentation from, I think it was... Uh, yes, Yeah, but one of the local districts. I think maybe Paul yeah. heard yeah. um, yeah, this. Is I know why you're thinking that, but I did go through this. This is a conglomeration of slides from various places. Yeah, gotcha. So Liberties is on the first one. Liberty. This is School Board U from NISBA. Yeah, and I don't think it's all applicable, but this is, this sort of paints the, the picture of what I think we should do. It's just my idea, so I wanted to get your thoughts on this open discussion. Roles and responsibilities are part of a much broader concept. And what I would suggest we do is 
sit together, the five of us, I don't even think we need a facilitator for this, in a board workshop setting and talk about our vision. So to, to do a complete visioning for the district. So you start with a vision and for the future of the district, you establish a mission statement, and then you set a series of broad goals, maybe no more than five, just broad, you know, 30,000 foot view goals that drive the future for the district. I think if we do that and we come to a consensus about what the vision is for our school and our community, that the roles and responsibilities kind of, you know, slide right in once we're all on the same page. So, just briefly, and, and please take this and review it. A vision is your district's goal. It's the ideal tomorrow that you strive to create today. It's widely disseminated and understood throughout the district and community. It's recognized by teachers and administrators as a common direction of growth, and it allows all stakeholders to align their improvement efforts. It clearly states the essence of what the district aspires to become. And it's brief, memorable, and inspiring. So you start with a vision, that's probably the biggest lift to figure out exactly what that is. What's the vision for Eldridge's future? I just, I just don't know that we're allowed to make, have that discussion in a workshop. I think that has to be in public. Really? I it's always under the guise of the workshop type of thing. We have a vision. Like we we have a mission statement and we have goals. What, what Brian's talking about, if you look at the email I sent out about a week ago on this topic, yes. um, this ties into the Comprehensive District Education Plan, which is up for re uh, mm -hmm. full rewrite in right. next year. So the way I recommend going about this, and that is an open meeting. It's the board can be there, parents can be there, whoever can be there, okay, uh, to, to discuss it. But the process that I have recommended in my email was NISBA does do a very good workshop on this. It would be worth our while to have them come in with us to do it, to lead us and guide us through the process so that we're not all over the place. And then we move forward with that process going into the next year so that we can have a new CDEF in place because the mission statement, the vision that's outlined in the CDEF a lot of work went into that and it was revised over the years, but it's another thing that hasn't completely been revised in many years, as is the case with many board offices. So my recommendation, and Brian's suggestion is excellent, is to take this as a multi-step process. Get NISBA in to do this. I've spoken to some of my colleagues, they do a very good job of this. To, to lay out that foundation, to provide those tools, so that we can then start working on it together. Mm -hmm. But I would say it would be worth our while to bring them in to start that process. The, I attended the CF meeting, um, because the board suggested that was probably the right vehicle, and, and I haven't shared this with you since the meeting, but basically, I think the CDEF handles most of this, right? But it really does, it's, it's community, I'm sorry, the Comprehensive District Education Fund. Mm -hmm. So it handles the education part, but I mean, bear with me, because this is a little crazy, okay? When I talk about the vision, what I'm, one of the things is the vision for the school as it relates to the community. So it's not all about education, it's about how the school interacts with the community, how the school engages the community, how the community participates in, in the school board process and the school process as well. That's one of the big topics that I would put forward as part of this vision. So, and, and there's about, you know, and one of the topics is creating a destination school. In other words, let's make Elder a place where people young families specifically want to come to. And that doesn't necessarily have to do exclusively with education. It has to do with a lot of the other great things that's going on. So CDEP is part of it, but I think it's a vision overall, more comprehensive view than I'm trying to get what I'm suggesting. Do you guys have any more? Is it crazy? Well, you can mean it's the that in the session. I think I think it's pretty clear. I, I um our job is to stay focused on student achievement, but it's a broad must be creating those citizens for the future. We're not creating them, we're encouraging them, whatever we're doing. You know, so I, I, I like that idea, and I like that idea of the vision being inclusive of community, like intentionally stating that we are wanted to be or are. Yeah, so yeah. look, this, this may sound cheesy, yeah. but the idea is that it should be a school at the center of the community. Mm -hmm. And some of it has to do with education, by the way, because now we've, we found people <coughs> in the community, John Conway is one, 
where he had the expertise in local history. He came in and got involved in our school. I ran into a guy who spent five years studying monkeys in Africa who lives in Glens Bay, who says that he'd love to come in and be part of our school. So we've got those people out there, so that's part of it. But the other part of it has nothing to do with education and has more to do with making the community see the value in what our school provides. In other words, to support what we need from them, to vote for our budgets, et cetera. So that's, that's part of that vision of creating a school that's at the center of the community. And then the other thing about creating a destination school, well, people would want to come to Eldred right now because we're all over the newspaper because our basketball team is incredible. You know, and because of all kinds of courses and stuff like that. So that's not always about education, too, if that makes any sense. It's a more comprehensive thing than education and where we fit into the community. Absolutely. But I think if we put our five heads together, we come up with some really great stuff. So I think it's time to do that. Okay. So so let's so let's um try to get some dates together. Maybe if everybody could email Bonnie a couple of dates, we could come up with uh, you know, we could you can come up with one. Um, is it is it best for week week nights or weekends? Oh, I hate to. Spring is coming up. I'm very partial to night weekends. <laughs> or the workshop. Or just the five workshop. Are we going to do just the five? Because I thought we were going to do the list of Well, just the initially, five the initially just the five. Okay. okay. So we're going to do and then we can do the list of it, it, It's not that bad. Do it, do it. Really, it won't be bad. But it's a forward-looking, future-oriented thing, so it's not urgent. Yeah, so right. Spring weather. First, and then right All right. So email Bonnie a couple of dates. Make a note of that, please. No, I'm saying that we'll share this morning first, and then we can break up and throw them back. October first. October first. Anybody have any ideas? On oh that? boy. Hello. What? Two ways to look at that. I would prefer to do the five of us first and then have the list for Okay? okay. That's, that's what I would do. I'm going to do, Doug. I think that's we should define what we want from this but first. I, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. And, and that'll help us how do you, how do you get there, how do you further develop it. Yeah. Okay. So we're doing week nights? Yeah, that um, works for me. Depends on the week night. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. It depends on the week night for all of us. Yes. One more time when you're talking. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Six thirty, seven o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Earliest? Six would be coming. Okay. Okay. Six. Six is okay. Okay. So you guys have homework then, or we all have homework. Nine o five. Board resolution on the compressor station. Um, last meeting we had Mr. Shack. Present. Mr. Shat was present. He gave us, um, he, he talked to us about the compressor station going up, up the street. And um, we reached out, we, we created a resolution. Uh, we, we passed, excuse me, we passed a resolution. We made a motion, passed a motion to uh, authorize Bob to get our, our board's attorney to draft this resolution that you have in front of you. And um, this is the product. I think the I think the stipulation was that we wanted to be we wanted to be somewhat parallel to the township's motion. Is it? But but leaning towards an education more of an educational slant, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think it's excellent. I've been working with the uh, Jeff Boss, and I've been working with our attorneys um, over the last four days. This nearest the township's resolution after the township passed their resolution on Tuesday night. Uh, Doreen faxed us over a copy of it. It went back up to our attorney, and the draft that was sitting on my desk was again revised, so it did more accurately reflect that and uh, this is the final product so i would need a vote on it and then i'm well, going to pass something around to you folks to sign so i can get this out tomorrow because the last time we did this it took me two weeks to get all of your signatures on the resolution we we certainly need to share this with our, with our, uh, our folks here first so somebody want to read through this you want to read the whole thing uh, okay i'll start <laughs> I think somebody else will pick it up. 
Resolution in opposition to Millennium Compressor Station to be built in the district. Whereas the Upper Central School District sits within the Town of Highland, and the Town of Highland has been a participating member since 1990 of the Upper Delaware Council Incorporated, an organization that works in partnership with the National Park Service to oversee administration of the River Management Plan for the Upper Delaware Scenic and Recreational River which the United States Congress designated in 1978 as a unit of the National Wild and Scenic Rivers System in recognition of its outstandingly remarkable values. And whereas in order to preserve the natural environment of Eldred Central School District and for the general health, safety, and welfare of the district residents and the local economy and to preserve and protect the scenic and other natural resources within the district, whereas the Town of Highland amended its zoning laws in 2012 and adopted local law number three of the year 2012, which amongst other things expressly prohibited compressor stations and other high impact industrial uses, as those terms are defined in the town code. Whereas in 2011 and 2012, the adjacent towns of Tustin, Bethel, and Lumberland all passed similar zoning laws for the same or similar purpose, each likewise expressly prohibiting compressor stations and each of those towns encompassing a portion of the school district, of the, of the district. And whereas in December 2015, Millennium Pipeline, LLC, hereby known as Millennium, purchased property in the Elk Central School District known as the property. And whereas on January 19, 2016, Millennium filed an application with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, to construct and operate a 22,400 HP compressor station on the property, the Highland Compressor. Whereas the construction and operation of such a compressor station would be contrary to provisions of the Town of Highland zoning laws as amended in 2012. Whereas compressor stations have been found to be significant sources of air pollutants by emitting volatile organic compounds such as propene, toluene, <coughs> ethyl benzene, and acetone, and fine particulate matter, as well as methane. And whereas it has been reported that the University of Albany research team found high levels of formaldehyde, a known, a known, known human carcinogen, exceeding health-based risk levels near compressor stations. And whereas Sullivan County is currently ranked 61, 61st out of, I had no idea, 61st out of 62 New York State counties with regard to the overall health of its residents. That's crazy. I didn't know what I said. Okay. Whereas, whereas Sullivan County is reported by the United States Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA, Environmental Justice Screening Tool, LJ Screen, to have a population close to 75% that is low income, less than two times the national poverty level, close to 60% over the age of 64, close to 50% below the age of five, and 50% minority populations all of which combined are indicators of an environmental justice, sensitive and disadvantaged community. All those percentages based on 2008 to 2012 U.S. Census data. Whereas the U.S. EPA defines environmental justice to mean that all people, regardless of race, color, origin or income, receive fair treatment and equal environmental protection and have the opportunity for meaningful involvement in decisions that will affect the environment and or health of their community. Whereas the American Medical Association and the Medical Society of the State of New York have adopted resolutions entitling Protecting Public Health from Natural Gas Infrastructure, which recognizes the potential impact on human health associated with natural gas infrastructure and call for a government assessment of risks associated therewith. And whereas compressor stations have both accidental and planned blowdowns to control black gas pressure, pressure which can create a 30 to 60 meter high gas plume, last as long as three hours and cause high levels of contaminant release. And whereas if the Highland Compressor is allowed to be constructed and operated, the tax base of Eldred Central School District could be negatively impacted due to the likelihood of declining property values and the inability to promote future development in areas near the Highland Compressors. Whereas less than two years after completion of the Hancock Compressor, Millennium's application with FERC con includes constructing a second 22,400 HP compressor station in Hancock, compounding concern about future undisclosed expansion plans for the property in the town of Highland. Whereas the Upper Central School District is committed to environmentally friendly 
practices for the benefit of both residents of the district and the natural land within the district. Whereas the construction and operation of the Highland Compressor is contrary to state and regional goals and will undermine the commitments and ongoing efforts of the Elder Central School District, town of Highland, Sullivan County, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve the overall health and well-being of its residents. That now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Elder Central School District hereby expresses its opposition to the Highland Compressor Station. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board urges the full environmental impact statement in conjunction with an air emissions baseline assessment and in compliance with the Clean Air and Water Act as they apply, as they apply, be conducted by independent experts acceptable to Millennium and the Town of Highland officials. Be it resolved that the Board urges that a comprehensive and transparent health impact statement as outlined by the Center for Disease Control and the National Academy of Sciences be conducted by an independent entity acceptable to Millennium, the Town of Highland officials, advocates, and the public, that this health impact assessment cover cumulative short and long-term impacts, including fugitive emissions and blowdowns, with an analysis of all, of all materials and contaminants transiting, transiting through the compressor station, such as radium precipitate, radon, and decay products. Resolved that the Board of Education joins in the request by the Town of Highland for FERC to direct the following occurs. Include in its environmental impact studies, opinions from public health experts who are independent and credible and free from conflicts of interest. Create a panel of independent experts to review current federal exposure standards around compressor stations, standards which could now be considered obsolete. Make sure any approvals of compressor stations meet any new health standards that are created. And work with local and county officials to address residents' concerns about the compressor stations. And then it's resolved that this will forward copy, the district clerk will forward copies of this resolution to the town of Bethel, town of Lumberland, town of Tustin, Honorable Andrew Cuomo, county of Sullivan, town of Tustin, town board, federal energy, Energy Regulatory Commission and the Honorable Chris Gibson, U.S. Congressman. Should I keep going? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, this, and this many more people. And that's why you should vote for me for president. No. <laughs> Sorry. Just you got sounded it. right. Thank you. Better than all the rest. No, I thought it was. I thought it was very. Well. I, I was very, very. Just one thing. Um, Commodore and I again have the pleasure of attending the uh, Highland Town Board meeting for the second time in a row and the uh, feedback from constituents, I know Mr. Chad's back here, but there were a lot of people who spoke in opposition to the compressor station, so it seems to be the overwhelming sentiment. But I do want to share one thing with you, and it's something that I don't personally believe, but I did have two constituents uh, suggest the following, okay, <clears throat> that the compressor station may have financial benefits to our community in terms of tax revenue, commerce, potentially the possibility for things like scholarships and internships and all this nonsense. It's not been directly mentioned by one. Okay? My feedback to those individuals was that, and I'm only bringing it to you because I have something I want to share with you. You can't balance uh, financial benefits with you know, cancer and birth defects and heart disease. It, just, it doesn't, you can't put them on the scale and balance it. So I said, can you please share with me some, you know, concrete science, like some believable stuff that's not sponsored by industry or by even by FERC, you know, but obviously paid by industry, um, that that refuse the health plans because the health plans are overwhelming. I, I, you know, this is all full of the bad things that can happen through the compressor station. Only if you can say that cancer is removed from the scale can you then consider tax revenue and commerce and all. Uh, and I didn't get any science. Okay, and I look, and there's no science. The health claims are pretty crystal clear. So, but I did want to share with you that there are people out there who believe that the compressor station might be good in terms of our economy, um, and that's something that you always consider as somebody who's trying to. Senator Bonasek stopped me in the Waller Walsberg High School last Friday, and pretty much implied the same thing to me. Well, that's why I said it's interesting. It's the second time I've heard that. I said. And nobody has approached the school district uh, one way or the other, pro or con. 
And I said, so we're making our decisions based on the best information available. But he also replied. Well, you know, it's similar to what the veterans asked us a while ago. How many jobs would it take to counteract the formaldehyde in the air? You know, like. Yeah. No, you can't. You can't balance it. It just doesn't balance. But that, that eight for our millennials probably sprinkling money around. Yeah. yeah. Our elected well, and the suggestion was that as a board of education, that we should invite millennials to provide their side of the story. And the fact is. We're not going to get any straight, believable, unbiased science from them either. So as long as you have health risks on the scale, even if they were to pay for our entire budget for a year, it doesn't balance. But I wanted to share it with you because we do represent the people. Should we look at adding some so we so we have the motion our discussion is over do we have a motion I'll make a motion. Okay. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? Same thing we'll go. Brian? Yes. Carol? Yes. Linda? Yes. Amdor? Yes. And I'll say yes. So well done. Sorry. Yeah. My apologies. Okay. So that takes us to public comments. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. I'm going to speak first because I'm going to get that. <laughs> My name is Paul Clark. Lately, I've been known as that crazy old guy who goes to school board meetings and talks too much. Okay, well, looking around this room, I don't see any old guys. Maybe Alan. <laughs> crazy or otherwise. But the fact of the matter is that 65% of the voters in this district are old people. You're counting on their votes. They're not really the ones paying all the taxes. The taxes get paid by the second homeowners, I believe. So maybe it's a good idea I'm here, maybe it's not. Um, I think I've been invaluable to the board with my experience. I think I'll be even more invaluable to new board members with my experience. Second of all, I want to talk to the board. Did you hear what Ms. Louise said? 65% 60, was the tax levy cap. That's the amount of money we can raise. Already we're looking at 89000 of increased uh, health care costs. 65000 probably doesn't even touch the, the increase in the CSEA contract. It certainly doesn't touch the increase in the faculty contract. So now these, these, this is money that you've got to get from somewhere. Where is it coming from? If it don't come from the state, it's got to come from reserves. If there's no reserves, where is it coming from? Okay, so the reason I'm talking to the board about this is you have to understand the gravity of where we are right now and what you have to do, and you need to have to take a smart stance on the costs. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'm going to do it because you said we over budgeted right for the office. We over budgeted for the office. Right, so for that, yeah. <laughs> And then we also put money in for CSA faculty, right? CSA has a little unknown Right. Okay. Okay. So CSA has little or no impact on the budget. It's significant. And then. And their contract was settled two years ago. Okay. Can anybody hear this? Their contract was um, settled two years ago. Faculty contract, we have money in. Right. Contract is under negotiation. This time, we do not we negotiate in public. So we don't, we don't have to worry about reserves, right? We have money put in there? We will present a revenue projection once we know what our revenues are. So I mean, we need to it, answer it that is, question. It is, it the is, money is there. We don't need to go into reserves. Paul knows my strategy for our equality. My strategy for the budget is the same as it has been for the past six years. I don't talk theory. I wait until we have a budget, and then I give you hard numbers and you make a decision. I can guess. I can postulate. I will wait until I have the numbers. Yeah. Simple as that. I think, Linda, that Paul, Mr. Clark, I don't think he's talking about this year. I think he's talking about sort of what I was alluding to previously, which is we need a vision. 
for when it's more difficult to take money from reserve, when maybe we have a lower tax cap, when our tax revenue doesn't okay, meet our expenses. Right. So we need to anticipate those things and have a more of a long-term strategic vision on what we're going to do to make sure that we don't have to take any way with anything away from our students. Yeah, well, what I heard tonight was he was saying now, and I just want people not to be, you know, get the wrong information that we just said that we have, you know, you talked about 65% um, tax cap. And the, um, well, it's not. He, he misspoke. It's a 1.0012. Right. He's doing $65,000. I think what, he, what I heard him say is that we, we have a $65,000 increase that we can do under the tax cap, but already $89,000 is up by <laughs> health care expenses. And you're right, we found money because it was right. good. So, the so point we need is to get that out. We don't have to run out and spend it just because we can. We need exactly. to get right. it. Right. So, Paul okay. is cautioning us. Mm -hmm. The same way he yes. cautions us every year. Yes. And he's very responsible about the caution he provides us with. Not saying Let's not put the cart before the horse. Okay. The final budget presentation will be in April. Any other public comments? Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the, to the board, um, for the residents that live up by where the compressor station is going to go, and for the rest of the residents in the town of Highland. We need the boss. Well, thanks for bringing to our attention. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Joanna, Dr. Barino. Um, One, I just wanted to, in case parents didn't see that you're doing the epic um, parent focus meetings to contact the um, office, which I'm excited about, because if you know anything about Monticello, before Epic came in, we had gun, uh, not gun, sorry, <laughs> gang stuff even in the elementary schools, and now that Epic is coming, I'm really excited since this all, the conversation started with us in the end of the summer, so I'm ecstatic about that, and I will be there. And two, um, I just have a question, because I'm one of the candidates for board, um, I know that there's been some confusion in town as to who is running for the board. Some people thought it was just one person, but I know that uh, Mr. LaPutte, you are. I yes. know Mr. Gingold is, I am, and Ms. Wagner. Apparently some people thought it was just one person who was running. Um, but I thought if the five of you met, it was called a quorum. And is that, is that only if you're discussing school issues or even if you sit and discuss your mission statement is that not here right now, but you guys are talking about we'll meeting, we'll and is that would that be considered a quorum? Yeah. So are you allowed to do a quorum? Because I'm yeah. looking up and learning about being a board of head member. We're, we're, we're going to have a workshop. So that wouldn't be considered under a quorum? Right. Okay. I'm just asking just yeah. so that I do. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hey, how's everybody doing? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so a couple of things, right? Um, there is, I have a question about what you guys do for um, budget-wise, well, with budget talk with, uh, you go around like asking teachers, that, like, like, let's say we sell new protractors and that needed to go into the budget. She needed like 100 protractors or something. Would you go up, do you go up to every single teacher and ask what they need? Kind of like that, something like that, maybe. Well, the building has their own uh, has their own way of doing it. They, they, you, you, you send out requisitions. Each Plus building has a fixed budget. Paper. They send it a paper. Each, right? each building yeah. has a fixed budget, and each teacher submits requisitions to their building administrator for approval. Okay. That would be considered a supply. It's already been done. It was done in December. Okay. And what I wanted to build off that is um. Music program. I know I saw in the whole, uh, is it, and wherever it was back when you guys did approved already, you guys talked about the whole music program. And it looks like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, really understand that you guys like it. It sounds like you guys care, but you guys do. I'm not saying you don't, but you just, you guys can make more effort for the music program in general because, um, my instrument I played for since seventh grade has not been cleaned out. It's falling apart as I'm playing it. And my sister has an instrument, and that thing's like trash. It's terrible. What I was thinking is if we can make a whole program, maybe, uh, I'm sure Mr. and I will be in for it, I'm sure a number of people could uh, agree with me with the whole program to get maybe a new instrument every single year, starting with, you know, it doesn't have to be this year, it can start like next year. 
or something because a lot of our equipment is just getting old and you know the timpanis are out of tune, the timpanis are breaking off because our music program is getting better and better every single year. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just it's hard to see another program like go downhill but go uphill at the same time kinda like because I was in football and watching football decline and decline now it's almost pretty much gone. And I don't want to see music program gone as well. Or not not treated uh or not uh, treated right, whatever. Uh, like I need I need a new mouthpiece. I've been needing, I needed one for like years. Um, uh, so if you need that stuff, your teacher should be going to Mr. Krebs. None of this has ever even hit my desk, so we'll we'll start by talking with Mr. Niverson tomorrow and finding out what's going on. Another thing, with Mr. Niverson is like Mr. Niverson. Everybody knows him. He's a nice guy. He gets pushed over very easily too. He's. Chris, our mm -hmm. music okay. programs have never been denied anything that they've asked for. No, he, he's not very okay, But then we'll have program. a conversation with Mr. Niveson to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Thank and, uh, that, that's it. Um, I would like to head off what Chris said, actually. One thing that uh, he just brought up was the piano in the, um, the band. I was told that since it's in such horrible condition, condition that needs to be tuned probably twice a year and I was told that it was brought up to the administration and in fact when, when we started student council in 2013 we were actually willing our group was willing to spend money to fix the piano because we were told that the administration sort of failed to look at that I'm not saying that's true I'm just saying that is what I've heard through great grabbing because it's not true okay I couldn't I couldn't say I don't and I'll certainly check it's, into that because the music department has approached me about accessing a piano at the elementary school, so that doesn't make sense. But I'll look into it. Okay. So I think what I heard you say before was that our music department has is, is gotten what they've asked for. They haven't asked for anything. They've, We're not they've asked to rent the equipment. We've rented the equipment. We've never denied them anything within reason uh, if they come up with a plan for it. We support our music program. First, I'm hearing a lot of it. It would be nice if the teacher did go to uh, uh, the building administrator or come into my office and discuss it with me. But we'll follow up on it. We have a purchase order in place for pianos. So we spend thousands and thousands of dollars a, a year on mouthpieces and reeds and rental instruments and piano tuning. So we'll check into it. I think we do know that the music program is a priority for all five board members. We've said that. I've heard you guys say that many times. I know that it's a passion of yours too, Mr. DeFore. So, it, I, I just there's an accuracy in the statement. I, I'm not saying you guys don't care about it. Just like oh, you did say that. Well, no, that, that's not what I meant. But we'll check in. What I'm what I was trying to say is like you guys could be doing more than what it says on paper. Well, we're doing quite a bit, Chris, but we will check into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing us our attention. Nice. Okay. Any other uh, public comments? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, Beth Dearman from Eldred. Um, I was wondering, is there a five or ten and or a ten year plan that the district has um, anywhere that um, you guys have put together or that um, we could see? And if not, then would that be something that you guys might be able to put into this um, the vision building exercise that you're going to be doing just to develop for the entire district, a five-year plan? We've, we've um, in the past year to year, we've developed goals. And um, this year, this year, we did not do that. We we're supposed to do that during our reorganization time, during July for this time. And this year, we didn't. And um, quite frankly, the reason we didn't was because some of our goals, our previous goals, were um, some were, were based on some testing, and we chose to move away from that. So we, so we kind of wanted to start cleaning. Okay, so yes, this would be something that we would we would discuss. You know, assuming I, I'm not sure that we're allowed to discuss goals. You know. Um, or goals unless it's in public. So I want to just double check that before we do that. And we do have a facilities plan that's okay. five, oh, five yeah. years, and we have a tech plan okay. that's, I don't know, five or more years. So we have plans in certain areas, uh -huh. but not an overarching five year plan that I know of anyway. But it's a good recommendation. Yeah. 
I wanted to just say one thing. So first of all, thank you for volunteering to be part of the Strategic Visioning Committee. That was a nice thing to do. <laughs> part of You're this, funny. by the way, Doug, to answer the question about the public part is that, you know, in a lot of these districts that did this visioning thing, what it led to is committees that include people from the community, like that, for example. Thank you again. And um, it's more of a strategic vision. It's not like, you know, what are our goals for the year. It's more of what the district will look like 10 years down the road. Oh, I'm just Yeah, right. Is that what you're saying? Like, you know, five, 10 years down the road, what does, what are the district's goals? What is it going to look like? Yeah, what do we, right? what do we want? to be what are we trying to look like I think that's the part of the visioning thing is to paint a picture of what the district should look like down the road and to engage all the people in the community including people who come to board meetings now and aren't currently coming uh, to collect all of their perspectives and to put that together in a way that is you know defines what the school looks like 10 years down the road. Right. that's what we're trying to embark on so thanks guys for calling. Okay. Any any other? Yeah, I just have one quick comment. I just wanted to uh, let the folks know that student council did. Uh, we we are you know, going to help you with the church. I will come down uh, this Sunday after services. At least you know I'll what? try my best. Yep. Can and we not do it this Sunday because in case the girls make it on Saturday. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. They will. Um, <laughs> and then, so then the Sunday after that, so come down right. after services, and I can, uh, you know. Thank you very much. Yep. I apologize. I, I don't know where it went, but my mind is not Okay. Yes. Sorry. Kevin Jennings. Um, I just have a question in regards to expanding our curriculum here in Eldred. I don't know what our curriculum was last year. I do know they sent home a curriculum this year. It looks like AP Physics was added, and I know Ms. Powell said um, there was two half-year art classes that were added. Was there more curriculum added to our current? There, there hasn't been anything added yet. We're waiting to see we what the uh, information comes back from the students during the um, selection process. It's, it's offerings. I yeah. guess added is the wrong word. It's, it's a course offering. So yeah, there have been more. Go to the course that have been added that we're looking to offer. I think that's what that was like we added. didn't have last year. Exactly. Correct. Three of them were AP Physics, AP U.S. History, and um, we're also looking at the AP art music classes, theory. AP Music Theory, also, and some art classes. We have some courses that some of the teachers have recommended in English and there's a course guide that's on the website mm -hmm. that you can look at all the courses that are there. That's a selection. <laughs> Which is fantastic. I just didn't know what we had last can year. We, right. But to that end, can we next year put something in next to it that this new is a new offering so yes. that it kind of stands out? Perfect. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I have a question then. Is there anything other than the AP classes? Have we added any curriculum such as maybe a genetics class, anything extra for our students to enjoy in just a regular curriculum? I mean, are all of our teachers right now teaching all their required periods in a profession or are we uh, covering lunches in study halls? No, there is a certain amount of lunches in study halls that need to be covered. As part Correct. of a supervisory, there's no way to do a schedule without having that, without having that flexibility. But do they necessarily have to be covered by a teacher at a teaching they profession? They have to be covered by a staff member, and in the junior senior high school, we only have one teacher assistant. The rest of them are, are teachers. So I do not have a lot of flexibility in the junior senior high school to cover anything other than the extra periods except for staff members. But to answer your question, there have been additions made in English. There are certain electives, I think, that Mrs. Yeah. Casey is offering. There, uh, the, art electives, courses. the art electives constantly change, depending on what the teachers feel uh, are the interest of the students. Mm -hmm. There is an array of science electives, astronomy, geology, mm -hmm. what are some of the others? Yeah, the 3D. Yeah, 3D, 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 3D. 3D. Well, those two the courses are new next year, yes. We did a business course for next year. The um, business analysis, business computer applications. We're trying to populate things each year with um, courses that kids may be interested in as an elective also. Good. Okay. Thank you. I have two questions on that. Do we have any uh, mechanism for uh, students or parents um, to recommend new courses to us to consider? Most of them come from the students themselves the based teachers. on what they have an interest in. Yeah. They let the teachers know. The teachers come back and say, hey, we're looking at this class for next year. We'd like to um, see if it will if it will fly, okay. if we can get enough interest in it to have it as a class. 
Others go by the wayside. We've attempted mythology, and you may only have a couple of kids that you know sign up for it. So then they're not usually put on the uh, course selection sheet for the following year. And the other question is uh, completely informed. I apologize. I have not looked into this. Just an open question. <coughs> If, is it possible for a public high school like ours um, to have like adjunct teachers from the community who may have expertise in a certain area and are willing to teach a course or a half course and even you know for volunteer their time? No. Do, there is not. Is that illegal? They need to be a New York State certified teacher and they have to be employed by the school district and uh, as part of the, they would fall under the faculty contract. So there's all sorts of legal provisions prohibiting that. But having people come in from the community to work with our faculty, that's absolutely not feasible. And that's what we're looking for. Good. Now, we mentioned, uh, just to go back a couple minutes, we mentioned that we are looking into the AP US history. I recommended, uh, I think, actually, uh, to last meeting, the meeting before that, that we sort of offer an educational either a PowerPoint or some type of flyer that explain the difference between, the pros and cons between AP, uh, like US history for example, versus Sullivan County Community College US history, which the AP course would be replacing, so that the parents and the, and the students could decide what they would be interested in more. Has that been, has that been taken under consideration? Griffin, nobody said that the AP U.S. History course was going to replace the Sullivan County Community College course. You said that twice. I we have not said that. The statement that I made in response to the last time you brought that up was, we have two offerings in the course offering book, and no final decision has been made. Yeah, and I, I understand that. But nobody but ever said one was replacing the other. One of the options we're looking at is offering them in conjunction with each other. That was a recommendation of the faculty. But nobody ever said one was replacing the other. Is that decision something that we have to vote on as a board at some point? Or no, that's an administrative decision. Right now, all of the guidance counselors are meeting with the uh, students. They're discussing the pros and cons of AP and versus Sullivan County Community College. We need to come to a final agreement with the faculty association with regards to the AP classes. There are a lot of pieces that fall into place, but the board was very clear last time that we would not replace any of our college classes with an AP class, and that was pretty much decided at the last meeting. Right. I remember that. <clears throat> Mr. Blanche, you had something? So I just, for point of reference, there's many courses in our course selection that aren't selected by students, and I actually would like to encourage parents to encourage your students to take a full schedule. <laughs> Yeah. And to take advantage of some of those classes, in all honesty, we have a lot of college classes that don't get run because students don't pick them. We have a lot of electives that don't get run because students don't pick them. Yeah. And so part, of, part of that that's absolutely <coughs> correct. We offer, we offer more than we teach because many students never select some of the course offerings that we have. To be honest, for a small school, we offer a very rich curriculum, I think. Yeah. Well, we have the um, district Facebook page now, which has been wonderful in terms of communicating with communicating parents. If there's a course that's like really great that students could benefit from and the parents and the kids aren't selecting it, maybe we can kind of highlight those on our Facebook page and the word out. Great more messages and getting home to the parents. Yeah. Like now, physics. How many kids have to be in the class for you to, to go ahead and give the class? The minimum we look for is 10, but we've made exceptions. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. I mean, we, we've actually gone below that, but we look to have 10. Is there a, um, well, I guess any any kid in school can have, as long as they have enough credits to graduate, you cannot discourage them from having multiple study halls, correct? We try to, but... Yeah, we can't. <laughs> You're right, we can't. I mean, a, a, a lot of the times, you know, uh, I, I recently met with a senior who came in with... Uh, uh, 22 and a half credits into a senior year. So outside of sitting through courses that were required to graduate, they did not need to take anything else. They were, though, taking chemistry, uh, taking uh, calculus. So they were, they were trying. But uh, that's not always the case. Yes? Um, is there a reason that we can't say that you have to take a certain number of credits every year, or every semester, or however it's broken up. I know that there's a certain number that you have to have to graduate, but can we say, like, you know, you have to have a certain number every 
year? Well, there are required courses in every grade level. Right, but can, uh, can we as a district, like, say that they have to do more than what the state be Yes, you keep, as a district we have in the past, mm -hmm. I recall about seven or eight years ago, we made a uh, decision that we were going to offer an online course to every student, and then shortly thereafter it was determined that that was not going to be feasible for us to do. So, yes, the district can increase requirements for graduation from their district if they wish. And or, and or courses. They can require certain courses uh, in which it are not um, required by the state in which to graduate. Okay. Ms. Santori, you had a question? Okay. okay. Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Carol okay, well, brought up something very important. Um, are we planning on having a PTA sponsored? Um, meet the candidates night the week before the election. It's typically recording. Excuse me. the budget hearing May 5th. the budget hearing May 5th. Yeah, that's We just kind of get it early and do that. Beth, is that still something that the PTA is going to ask? I didn't know that we were supposed to do that. Yes, we are. Traditionally, the PTA has hosted. The PTA will be hosting a Meet the Candidates Night. I will provide. You and I will talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You just provide the special and just I, we will have and you yummy things. the candidate. Absolutely. Thank you. I didn't know, so thank you. <laughs> okay, any other public comment, guys? Okay, if we don't have any other public comment, then we need a brief executive session to discuss um, contract negotiation. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Fine. Uh, Carol? Yes. Linda? Okay. Yes. And I'll say yes. We will not be doing any business after the after our <laughs> Thank you.